Oh, that's good. That's good. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there today. Uh, it's a special day, and we hope you feel uh, appreciated and honored today uh, as we celebrate Father's Day. And that's a, just a humorous little look at stuff we never say. All right. Uh, I want to mention a couple things before we get into the message today. Uh, One is we have a um, a family in our church, Matt and Judy O'Dell, who just this past week, uh, uh, Judy gave birth to uh, their son, Timothy Maximus, who was born uh, weighing six pounds and was 20 ounces long. I texted Matt and said, what were the specs on him? I said, you know, I don't know why I said it that way, but asked for the specs. But anyway, six pounds, 20 ounces. Uh, This is a picture of Matt with the little boy there, Timothy. And uh, I don't know if you can read that shirt, but the shirt on the, on the baby says, Pack my diapers, I'm going fishing with daddy. Anyway, I thought that was cool. That's cute. But we, we congratulate them and celebrate with them as they welcome Timothy uh, into their home this week. Uh, just I also want to mention a couple other things to you before we jump into the word uh, this morning. Uh, uh, next Sunday is a special day. We've got a lot of things going on next Sunday here at our church. And uh, you can find details about all this in your bulletin, but I just want to mention it to you. Uh, So you'll be aware of it. Um, We are taking up a special offering next Sunday uh, for our 2020 vision. We're a little under 10% uh, raised so far of our $50,000 summer goal uh, for that. And everything that goes towards that, that's given towards that over the summer, is ultimately going to the work of of renovating our sanctuary, replacing our heating and air, and reducing our debt. So it's all uh, working towards that. But next Sunday, we're going to do a special offering specifically for that to help Uh, draw a little more attention to it. So be prepared for that, to be able to give whatever God would lay on your heart to give towards that above and beyond uh, your tithes and offerings. There's details in the bulletin about it. But also a special Sunday next Sunday morning as well, because we're going to be participating in celebrating as a church family uh, in baptism with several individuals that have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they are following him in believers' baptism and being baptized next Sunday. And so we're going to be Uh, celebrating together with that. And if you've trusted Christ and you've never taken that step of obedience, there's a sign-up sheet out there uh, in the lobby. Uh, Sign up today before you leave so that I can contact you this week and we can get you scheduled to take that step of obedience as well uh, if you feel that it's time for you to do that. Now, uh, so that's next Sunday. And then also next Sunday night, there's a whole insert in your bulletin about this, uh, but we're going to do something special for Sunday nights during the summer starting next Sunday night. And that's what we're calling Titus 2 Talks. And so uh, it's going to be over in the Family Life Center at 6 o'clock where we're going to come together as a whole church family. And uh, you can read about that through the insert in the bulletin. And we'll say a little bit more about that next Sunday morning as we get ready for that. But that'll start next Sunday night where we come together as a whole church family for worship, for teaching from the Word, and for being able to learn together as a whole church, one generation to the next. Psalm 145 tells us that one generation will proclaim the works of the Lord to the next. And in order to do that, we've got to come together as a church body and church family, one generation and another, so that we can hand down the faith, as the Scripture tells us to do. And we're going to start trying to do some of that through these Titus 2 talks on Sunday night, starting next Sunday night. All right, today, uh, for Father's Day, I want to talk to you about a message I've titled, What It Takes to Be a Real Man. And so uh, here's what we're going to do uh, today. It's going to be topical. We're going to read a couple verses that I'm going to ask you to turn to in just a few minutes, which you'll find in Joshua chapter 24. Um, and you, you'll find those in, in a little bit as we get to one of the points. I want to, you to specifically see that in your Bible. So you can go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 24 as uh, we get ready for this. We're also going to be welcoming some new members into our church family this morning uh, at the end of the service, and I'm excited about that. Uh, But today I want to just talk to us men about what it takes to be a real man. So this is going to be plain, it's going to be simple, it's going to be uh, straight, I hope, and just uh, easy to understand and and plain, clear, and simple what it takes to be a real man. I want to challenge the men, the dads, the fathers, the grandfathers, whether you're a, a dad or a uh, a grandfather, or, or whether you're just a man in our church, you, you serve a, a fatherly function. And I want to speak to you today and challenge you from the Word of God about what it takes to be a real man. You know, e- even in my own life, um, I grew up largely with um, the absence of my own dad filling that role in, in my life. But there were other men, my grandfather, uh, men in the church, a youth pastor, 
a teacher at the school, my basketball coach. There were other men in my life that helped fill that gap and that void for me in order to provide for me the role of what it takes and what it looks like to be a man and to be a real man. And so whether you're a dad or not, you f if you are in the church here, our church, you serve as part of and you are belong to part of the spiritual community and spiritual family that God has called out here. And you have a role and a place in this church as a man to pass on the faith and to fulfill that, that role for others. And so I want to speak to all of us men uh, today. Uh, the Anglo-Irish the, the Anglo statesman of the 18th century, Edmund Burke, he's the one who is um, famous for having said these words, that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. You've heard, how many of you heard that before? Right? We, we hear that often. He said that in a political context, in a nationalistic sense about preserving uh, their nation. But the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Uh, I, really, I really believe that part of the problem that we are seeing in our society today, part of the evils that we are even experiencing in our world and in our culture today, it, it can be attributed to the fact that uh, for many years, good men have done nothing. Good men have done nothing. Uh, a lot of the problems in our society can be attributed to a period of history here in our nation, in our culture, that experienced and has experienced a lack, an absence of the Father and of men in our culture that teach other men what it looks like to be a man. And, and so we have literally in our culture, even today, we have men who do nothing, but we also have and I think this is another part of the problem. We have men who are doing a bunch of good things, but neglecting the best things. And so I really think the problem in our culture today is that we have men who do nothing, and there are a lot of that going on. There's a lot of that going on, but we also have men who are doing a lot of good things, but they are doing those to the neglect of the best things. And so what I want to do today is challenge us men to manage these five commitments, and, and this is not exhaustive, this is not comprehensive, there may be more, they're not going to be outlined in any particular order of importance, but I want to challenge us to consider as men the five most important commitments that we must manage in order to be real men, and so I want to speak to, to you today. <clears throat> so, um, I say manage, these are commitments we have to manage, we're going to talk about these, we're going to move through them. I'll show you in scripture where they come from, but I'm calling these commitments that we need to manage as opposed to what do we normally talk about with commitment, making commitments, uh, but, but any, anybody can make commitments, I mean, we could all probably talk about commitments we make and we break, and we all know what New Year's resolutions look like, and where we make a commitment, and then we break it like, you know, February, those kinds of things, um, it, we all know what that kind of thing looks like, anybody can make a commitment, but in order to really be obedient to God, to be a real man that God has called you to be, you got to manage this. These are commitments that you have to manage daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, for the long term, for the long haul. It's got to be something that you manage. You don't just make it, but you've got to manage it. And the first is this. You need to make a commitment, manage this commitment to be a man of responsibility. This is the first thing you got to understand that I want you to understand today is if you're going to be a real man, you have to be a man of, everybody say responsibility. Responsibility. Uh, someone said this, men are at their best when they are responsible and at their worst when they are not. Men are at their best when they are responsible and at their worst when they are not. I think the scripture calls men to be men of responsibility. You know, it's interesting uh, the Bible calls us to work hard, to take care of what God has given us. <clears throat> the, the very first thing that God did after creating Adam in the very beginning, <clears throat> the very first thing he did after he created Adam was what? He put him in the garden to cultivate and to keep it. To cultivate and to keep it. Now, I want you to just imagine this. All right, everybody imagine this for just a second. Think about this. God created man... And before sin came into the world, he asked him to work. We all thought work was like just the curse of sin, right? 
I mean, the toil at which we have to work with maybe has changed, but even when God, before sin entered into the world, when God created man, he gave man responsibility. It says he placed him in the garden, Genesis 2.15, to cultivate and to keep it. That is, God says to every man, here is something that is under your jurisdiction. Every man has influence, has a sphere of influence, has an, uh, an area of jurisdiction or something that God has entrusted him to care for, to keep, to cultivate, to protect. <clears throat> Part of what it means to be a man is to embrace responsibility. We have a responsibility as men uh, and in, a responsibility to do a few things, to embrace masculinity, to grow and to become mature is part of that. We have to be men who will be responsible men. Uh, David, King David, <coughs> excuse me, King David challenged his son Solomon in 2 Kings 2, verse 2. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a what? A man. Be strong and show yourself a man. Now, I do want to clarify this and just sort of preface everything I'm going to say today. Like, like there might be a couple things I'll say today that won't be politically correct. But I'm a little more concerned, and we ought to be more concerned about being biblically correct than politically correct. And so I want to try to strive today to be biblically correct, even if... Some of what comes across is not politically correct. But David said to Solomon, be strong and show yourself a man. We live in a world and a culture that tries to do away with male-female distinctions, tries to do away with the idea of boys acting like boys and being men. Oh, we want to tell them to be quiet and sit down, and you know we want the boys to act like girls. I mean, it's kind of what we're trying to do a lot of our culture today. But David said, as a man, he said to Solomon, you need to be strong. Part of what it means to be a man is to show yourself strong, to prove yourself to be a, a man. There is this connection, even in the scripture, you could see it in, in a lot of different verses where there's a connection between being strong and being a man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> He says, be strong and show yourself a man. There are other places. 1 John 2, 14, John said, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. And even in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, uh, says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Uh, to be a man, you've got to take responsibility, responsibility to be strong and to grow in that strength. Not just physically, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally. There's a strength and there's a difference about you as a man. And so the scripture says, like, we are to be men. And we live in a culture that wants to do away with that. But yet the scripture says, no, we need to be men. We have a responsibility, a responsibility to embrace our masculinity and what that looks like and to grow in maturity. Uh, there, there is something different about men and women. Could we all at least admit that? There is a difference today, right? Men and women are different, right? And the scripture calls men to be men of responsibility, who embrace their masculinity, who are strong, not just physically, but mentally, spiritually, socially, emotionally, and they grow in that strength, standing firm in the faith. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. I think part of our problem today, I want to just challenge you men, like we've got to grow up and be men of responsibility, taking ownership and responsibility for our own life, for our own families, for our own actions, for what happens in our lives and in our worlds, we've got to take responsibility for that and embrace that. That's what God has called us to do. And part of what that means is we grow up and we become men who embrace that and put away childish things. I thought this, and I thought this is a good way to put it. Too many men today, this is part of the problem today, too many men today live with the freedom of manhood but only the responsibility of childhood. It's like at some point in our culture today, men have like, all right, I want the freedoms that come with being an adult and being a man, and they get those, they take those, they embrace those, 
and yet they only maintain the responsibilities still of childhood. Uh, for example, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a 30-year-old man who won't, will not stop playing video games to read a book to his child. Hey, is anything wrong with playing video games if you're 30 years old? No, right? Nothing wrong with that. But if you won't stop playing that game to spend time with your child, to read a book to them, or to do something you know, with them, to teach the scriptures to them, or to lead your family, if you won't put it away for that, then you have embraced the freedom of manhood with only the responsibility of childhood. And to be a real man, the scripture says we've got to be men who are responsible. It's, it's the 40-year-old dad who will not talk to his hurting teenage daughter because the playoffs are on. Nothing wrong with watching the playoffs. Nothing wrong with that. But if it comes in the way of doing something that you're called to do as a man in your responsibility, it's wrong. And we're to be men of responsibility. It's the father who will not go to church with his family on Sunday because he stayed out all night Saturday night at the bar. Hey, that's fun. Having fun. Good time. You know, that's childhood. There's a responsibility that you have as a man now. And so the scripture says we are to be men of responsibility. Would any man acknowledge that today and just affirm that what I'm saying is true, or am I just the only one talking about this? Is this right? I mean, do you agree? All right. Number two, the second commitment that we've got to manage is we've got to be men and be a man of integrity. If we're going to be a real man, we, not just, we cannot only be men of responsibility, but men of integrity. Integrity means wholeness or completeness. <clears throat> it's the opposite of hypocrisy. Uh, the Bible oftentimes uses words like this when it talks about integrity, upright and blameless, upright and blameless. Men are to be men of integrity. If we're going to be a real man, we've got to have character. What you hear is what you see. What you see is what you get. You've got to be dependable, honest, trustworthy. Doesn't mean you're going to get it right all the time, but there needs to be a trustworthiness and a dependability about your life. You need to be a man of character and integrity. Proverbs 11:20 says this, those of a crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. You know, those that have integrity bring a delight to the Lord. Psalm 15, 5 says that a man who is a man of integrity will not be shaken. He won't be rattled because he's whole. He's, he's complete. He, he, what he says, he does. And what he does matches up, and, and there's a consistency to his life. There's not a, a burden on his conscience that he's engaging in something that's not true and authentic and real. He's not lying. He's not living a, 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 a double life. And so in his conscience, it is clear. And so because of that, he is not shaken in what he does. He's not concerned all the time that he's about to be found out or caught or not worried about that. The things, the challenges of life don't shake him because he's a man of integrity the scripture says there's blessings that come when we live as men of integrity. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse 7 says, The righteous man walks in his integrity. And here's what happens. His children are blessed after him. Your children will be blessed if you are a man of integrity. Psalm 112, verse 2, The generation of the upright, all right, the descendants of the upright, they will be blessed. So are you, are you a man of integrity? I want to challenge you to think about that. Are you... Are you a man of integrity? Do you maintain character? You're going into a theme park with your family, and you're looking at the prices, and you're like, wow, we want to charge like $50 for three to seven-year-olds. And you're like, man, kids two and under get in free. And you've got, you know, you got like five kids, you know. It's like, this is going to cost a lot of money. And, but you're thinking... My youngest has just turned three like a month ago. They're not going to card him. They don't want to see his ID. And so you're there going, I'll just say he's two. Have you not felt that temptation? You've experienced that kind of thing? Are you a person of integrity? That Making that kind of a decision says something about who you are as a person and as a man. And real men realize that that's a blemish on their integrity the scripture calls us to be men of integrity if we're going to be real man, real men. Now, uh, number three, I think we need to manage this commitment to be a man who leads his family. Be a man who leads his family. <clears throat> the scripture teaches us in the New Testament. <clears throat> the scripture teaches us in the New Testament. 
Ephesians 5, 23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Scripture teaches the man is to be the one who leads the family. 1 Corinthians eleven three, Paul said, I want you to understand the head of every man is Christ, but the head of the wife is her husband. The head of Christ is God. So Scripture places the responsibility of leadership in the home on the shoulders of the man. Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Whose responsibility is it to bring their children up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord? It's written and directed to fathers. The man is called in Scripture and is commanded to be the provider, the protector, the spiritual leader in his family. I want to say this. Every Christian husband and father, listen to this. Every Christian husband and father will have to answer to God for how well he leads his family. Speaking of myself. Every Christian husband or father will have to answer to God for how he leads his family. I promise you, I promise you, he will never have to answer to God for how many years he won his fantasy football league. He will not have to answer to God for how well he knew all the statistics of Carolina basketball. And he will have to answer to God for how well he led his family spiritually. Nothing wrong with fantasy football. Nothing wrong with knowing the Tar Heels. I think it takes a good Christian to know that anyway. I'm sorry. Nothing wrong with knowing those things. But we cannot spend all of our energy, thoughts, and effort and attention on those things and neglect the more weightier things that God has commanded and called us to as men of responsibility who he has placed the burden of leadership of the family on our shoulders. Do you understand that? We will not have to answer to God for those trivial things that we spend so much of our time and energy and effort in, but we will have to answer to God for how well we have led spiritually in the home. I read a statistic this week that uh, alarmed me, and uh, I want to share it with you today. It says this, that when dads, studies have indicated that when dads lead spiritually, their children are 20 times more likely to stay in church long term than when moms are the spiritual leaders at home. When dads lead spiritually in the home, their kids are 20 times more likely to stay in church long term than when moms are the spiritual leaders at home. Look, there's exceptions, of course, to these kinds of things. I'm an exception to this sort of a statistic. I sort of defy this, this statistic, and we all know people that do, but we certainly don't want to fight against these. If we are men here today, we want to rise to the challenge and say, I'm going to do what it takes for me to lead spiritually in the home. Uh, this is where I want you to read Joshua 24. Look at Joshua 24. If you have your Bibles there, I want you to see it, verses 14 and 15. Joshua 24, verse 14 says, uh, and this is after the children of Israel have uh, been conquering and going throughout the land that God had promised them, and they've been conquering it, and Joshua's getting ready to die, and he challenges all of Israel and the leaders of Israel <coughs> with these words. He says, Now, therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Joshua challenges the, the people of Israel, the leaders of the country, the leaders of the nation. He says, look, you've got to make a choice. You're going to serve the gods your father served in Egypt. You're going to serve the gods of, uh, of the, the country that you're ser currently residing in here. You're going to serve the gods of the Amorites. Or you're going to serve the one true living in God. You have to make the choice 
But he says, I'm making the choice for me and for my family. For me and my household as a spiritual leader, he says, we will serve the Lord. He says, I can't control what everybody else does. I can only challenge you as the leader of the nation. I can challenge you, he says, to serve the one true God. But you have to make that choice for yourself. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. If you're going to be a real man, you have to lead your family to honor and serve the Lord above everything else. Joshua says, you have to choose. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the idols and the, the false gods of Egypt or the false gods of the Amorites? Or are you going to serve the one true God? <clears throat> we live in a culture and a world today where we have many different gods. We have many different gods here in this culture. And just because we don't set up little figurines and worship wooden idols doesn't mean we don't have idols, doesn't mean that we don't have gods in our culture today. We have gods <clears throat> in our culture. The God of self comes through in many different areas, sports, significance, pleasure, all these different things. We have all these different things that we worship today. We put up on pedestals above our relationship with God. There are many different things in our world today that they're not bad in and of themselves here in our culture. They're not bad. They're not wrong in and of themselves. But when they usurp the position of number one in our life, they become our idol. They become our God. And they dethrone God from the place that he deserves in our life. Every man has to make the decision for his family and for what he's going to do with his life. Am I going to let my family and am I going to lead and teach my family to wor worship and serve these other gods, the gods in our culture today? Or am I going to teach and lead them to serve the one true God? And that shows up much more in our actions than even in our words. If you're going to be a real man, you have to love, care for, protect, and lead your family. Billy Graham said this, a man is never more important than his family. Think about that. Think about everything that he did and everything that Billy Graham was involved in and the, the, all the things he accomplished with his life. And yet he says, you're never more important than your family. And you can look back if you saw any of the funeral that they had for him and all the good things that his kids were able to stand up and to say about him. I think he lived that out even in all the work that he did that he realized he's not more important than his family. Mother Teresa said it like this, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Think about that. If you're going to be a real man, you have to choose that you're going to lead your family. You're going to lead them to worship and serve in sincerity and faithfulness, Jesus Christ. Number four, and I separated this one out, be a man who loves his wife. If you're married, you need to be a man who loves his wife if you're going to be a real man. Scripture says in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Now, I separated this out. You say, well, this might fall under leading his family, and, and certainly it does, but I want to separate it out just a little bit here because we've, you've got to be a man who, who loves his wife, who loves his wife. Uh, I, you, I have seen, and, and we all could probably tell stories of this, I have seen where all right, the kids come into the picture, and, and suddenly it's like, all right, everything revolves around the kids now, right? And so the relationship between the man and his wife goes apart. And it's like it becomes shallow and nothing. And then the kids grow up and the kids get into college and the kids get married or the kids get out on their own. And suddenly it's like there's two individuals left at home here, husband and wife. And they're like, I don't even know who this is anymore. Because we've spent the last 25 years raising kids to the neglect of maintaining the relationship with each other. If you're going to be a real man, you still have to love your wife and care for her and nourish her and cherish her and sacrifice things for her. To love means to sacrifice for. That means you've got to lay down some of your rights and privileges in order to love, care for, and develop the relationship with your wife. Sometimes that's tough, and there's things that, you know, hey, look, as a, as a college guy with no obligations you would go and do these things but as a married man you stay home and you love and care for your wife and you spend time with her uh, Stephen and Alex Kendrick the ones that put out the love dare and 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 uh, fireproof and courageous and some of these movies that came out uh, uh, over the last uh, five or six years they said this the co God's calling for husbands is not to marry the woman you love but to love the woman you married I want to just challenge you to think about that for a minute 
your calling by God is not to, hey, look, let's find the woman, all right? Let me find the woman that makes me most happy, and I'm going to marry her. Or if you're a married man, if you're a married man, God's calling you is to find your happiness in loving your wife, all right? It's not for you to marry the woman you love, but to love the woman you marry, and that, that you married, and that involves sacrifice, and that involves laying aside some things that, you know, you could do in order to love your wife. Theodore Hesburgh said the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. E- even for the kids' sake, the best thing you can do is to love your wife. And so this is what it takes. If you're going to be a real man, we've got to be men who manage certain commitments. And those commitments involve loving your wife and leading your family and being a man of integrity and a man of responsibility. And then lastly, being a man who remains faithful, being a man who remains faithful. Proverbs 28, verse 20 says, A faithful man will abound with blessings. 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, Moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. We need men today who approach life and who approach the Christian life as a marathon and not as a sprint. My challenge to you today is to, over the years of your life, to be faithful to managing these commitments. Be faithful over the long haul. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to your wife. Be faithful to lead your family. Be faithful to the church of Jesus Christ. I would encourage you, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. See, what's the work of the Lord for me as a man? We've just talked about that. Be a man of responsibility. Be a man of integrity. Lead your family. Love your wife. Do that over the long haul. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. So, this is my challenge to you today. Men, speaking to myself, Let's be men of responsibility and integrity who lead our families, love our wives faithfully over the long haul. This is probably the biggest question you have right now is this. Yes, but how? (laughs) Yes, but how? Because I look at this list and it's sort of, you know, it's tough. So yes, but how do I do that? I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This is the last thing I'll close with. Ephesians chapter 2. It's in the New Testament. This is how you do it. This is how I would encourage you to do this. We're going to read from Ephesians 2. We're going to read a little passage as we close to see that all these things that that really God has called men to do and to be are not um, things that we're left in and of our own power to do. This is how I would encourage you to be a man of responsibility and integrity who leads his family and loves his wife faithfully. Number one, I would encourage you to remind yourself daily. All right. Remind yourself daily of these things. I promise you, you're not going to see ads and commercials on television, and you're not going to see billboards, and you're not going to get notifications on your phone, you know, through Facebook and Twitter, and so you're not going to be bombarded with a bunch of ads encouraging you to be a man of responsibility and integrity who leads his family and loves his wife and who does that faithfully. You are not going to be bombarded every day with messages from our culture and our world telling you to be this. You're not going to get that. You know what you are going to be bombarded with daily it's commercials about the playoffs and the fantasy football coming up. And, you, you know, you're going to be bombarded with all of these other things that in and of themselves we've said are not, like, necessarily bad, okay? But you're not going to be bombarded with messages to be the kind of man God wants you to be and he calls you to be in order to be a, a man. So you have to remind, figure out a way somehow 
Write this stuff down. Post it on your mirror. Set, um, you know, make every day an appointment on your calendar that notifies you first thing in the morning, reminding you to be a man of responsibility and integrity who leads his family and loves his wife and does that faithfully over the long haul. Figure that out. Like, remind yourself, because our world is not reminding us daily of these things. But this is what God calls us to. So I'd say remind yourself daily. The other thing I would say is, like, request God's help. <clears throat> We are commanded over and over and over and over again in Scripture to go to God for help. So request his help. Because you're, you're not, like, there are certain things. Jesus even said there are certain things that just will not be accomplished apart from, like, prayer and fasting. And so I would say, like, request God's help. I'm, I'm telling you, in the last year and a half, two years, there have been times I have literally laid out flat, prostrate out, arm stretched, laid out on the floor in a room totally alone, by myself and just said, God, you have got to help me. Because I cannot be the man that I'm called to be without your help. You've got to request God's help. And then the last thing I would say is you rely on his spirit. And this is where I want to read to you. Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians 2 verse 8. We're going to read through verse 8 through the end of the chapter. It says this. Listen to this. And I want you to just listen to the strength and the power that God promises to you in his spirit. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. But listen to this. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus before good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All this stuff that we've been talking about today the scripture says, God says, I prepared beforehand all of this that you, that each of you, every man here today, God is saying to you, I have prepared beforehand that you should walk in all of these things. Because you're part of God's creation, his masterpiece. Now listen to what he says, therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So look at everything God has done to bring you to peace with him. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, building on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Like God says, he has prepared beforehand all of these things that you should walk in this. That's what he's saying. He's prepared all these things beforehand that you should walk in them. And he is giving you the power to do that through the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit that is in you because you have been brought at peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ by his grace. Say, look, you're not going to do this on your own. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to cooperate with the Spirit. You're going to have to follow the leading. You're going to have to not grieve the Spirit's working in your life as it leads you to do these things. You've got to work with it. But the power and the strength comes from the help of God through his Spirit. And that's what I would encourage you with today. Let's be real men. Let's be real men. Men of responsibility and integrity who lead our families and love our wives and do that faithfully over the long haul. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? As we uh, close and prepare to have a, a song this morning of invitation, uh, I, I want to encourage you as we stand in just a moment and sing, I want to encourage you men, whether you're, whether you're a, 
spiritual father in our church, or whether you have your own kids at home now, or whether you will soon one day have kids, or whether you're a grandfather, I want to encourage you to come this morning as we sing, and I want you to just make this prayer of commitment to the Lord this morning and ask Him to give you the strength to do these things so that we can fill the void and the absence and the gap in our culture and in our world that's lacking and be the men that God has called us to be. I want to encourage you to just come and step out and come forward and pray and just lift this up to the Lord today and ask Him for strength as we sing. Father, Lord, we love you and we... Father, we worship you today. We pray, Lord, that you would make us into the men that you have called us to be, that you would empower us through the work of your spirit. We cannot do it on our own, but we have to work in partnership and cooperation in tandem with the spirit inside of us that leads us to be this kind of men. And it's tough. We're in a world that makes it very difficult at times to do these things. We've got to put off all of that and focus on what you have called us to be. And so I pray that you would help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray and in his power we ask these things. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing. And I want to encourage you if you'd like to come to